Hello, everybody, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today for our shift, the resiliency of changing communities. I understand we have quite a few people joining us today for the second of our two shift challenge virtual events. Um, I'm not going to say any numbers, but you know, they're large. I'm really excited to hear today's talk, and I'm so happy to that you're all here with us as well. For those of you who weren't at the last webinar, I'm going to repeat myself now. Uh, my name is Susan Spiegel, and although I'm originally from Sudbury, I'm a Toronto-based architect. I've been working in and adjacent to the architectural profession for more than 30 years, and most recently as the head of my own multidisciplinary firm, Susan Spiegel Architect, uh, and also as an educator at George Brown College in the Institute Without Boundaries, and I have been doing that for 14 years. In January, I became president of the Ontario Association of Architects, our OAA. The OEA regulates the practice of architecture in this province, and our primary purpose is to protect the public interest. As president, I lead the governing council, which sets priorities to guide our actions and initiatives. So on a personal note, I am passionate about the roles architects pay, play in designing an inclusive world. And I'm inspired by daring ideas that push the possibilities of the built environment. And right now we really need those daring ideas because we face so many intersecting challenges. While we strive to emerge from a global pandemic and as our profession pushes to become more diverse and equitable, we also have a reckoning with our own personal and professional roles in responding to our very present climate emergency. But to begin, I want to recognize the traditional lands on which we are now individually situated. I know we're meeting virtually today and in different locations, but we do come together from our homes and offices in the Indigenous territories across Turtle Island. So on behalf of the OEA, we are grateful for the opportunity to meet and work on the traditional lands of many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples who have been the guardians of this place we call Ontario for thousands of years. In particular, we acknowledge that the OEA headquarters is located in Caronto on the traditional terry of the Haudenosaunee, the Métis, the Huron Wendat peoples, the Chippewa, the Anishinaabe, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. On our website, oaa.on.ca, we recently launched a fantastic Indigenous architecture page under the resources menu. And it is an evolving collection of various news items and educational opportunities in the context of our Truth and Reconciliation Committee. It relates to the architectural profession. It's only just begun, and I'm really excited to see it grow. I hope you'll visit it. The reason we've all gathered here today is to talk about the outstanding selections from the SHIFT 2021 Resiliency Architecture Challenge. SHIFT is a relatively new addition to the OEA's biennial awards program, and it occurs in opposite years to our Design Excellent Awards, which, by the way, making a little pitch here, we are still accepting at submissions um, for the 2022 awards until January, so don't miss the deadline. But back to SHIFT. SHIFT is an aspirational ideas program. This is where we encourage our licensed members intern architects, student associates, and others to demonstrate how architectural thinking, design thinking, can offer a new approach to addressing pressing societal issues. Our first uh, shift challenge in 2019, where the theme was infrastructure, this time the theme is resiliency. Our goal with this program is to broadcast and celebrate how those in the architectural profession can use their skills their education and unique perspective to take an active role in bringing about real, positive, actionable change. So our jury chose five submissions to spotlight this year, and we uh, are showcasing two of them today and featuring three earlier this month. So if you missed that one, don't worry, both sessions will be shared on the OEA YouTube page. Um, now I would like to introduce our moderator, whom I have to confess is one of my favorite architects in the world, Joe Lobko. <laughs> Joe is a partner at DTAH Architects, a practice with long-term commitment to the integration of urban design, landscape and architecture in the design of our rapidly growing and evolving Canadian urban environment. 
He spent more than a dozen years teaching architecture at the University of Toronto and also chaired the Toronto Society of Architects, where he spearheaded the TSA Guide Map of Contemporary Architecture, a team project that served as a catalyst for the public to explore the city and understand the built environment around us. In his closing year as the TSA chair, Joe sent then Mayor David Meller a letter slash urban manifesto called Toward a Clean and Beautiful City Initiative, 10 suggestions, which helped shape the city's contemporary policy toolkit for design excellence, helping bring forth innovative policies like Toronto Green Development Standards, the City of Toronto's Design Review Panel, on which he continues to serve. Last year, Joe received the OEA's G. Randy Roberts Service Award. I'm very glad to see you, Joe, and happy to share this shift award stage with you. Over to you, Joe. Thanks. <clears throat> well, um, welcome everyone who have uh, taken the time today to hear uh, two Ontario stories around community revitalization as part of the Ontario Association of Architects Shift Program. Uh, thank you, Susan, if I might start there for that introduction, um, <clears throat> which I um, wasn't quite expecting. Um, but also, um, I wanted to say um, someone like Susan, who volunteers this time to lead the OEA, bringing that creative and compassionate spirit to bear on, and this incredible skill set she brings to bear on the responsibilities of managing an organization like the, or helping to provide leadership to the OEA in such a challenging time. Um, there aren't many of us, I think, that are, you know, able and willing um, to do uh, the things you do, Susan. And uh, your passion uh, and your spirit around architecture is inspiring. So thank you for all of that, Susan. And I also want to extend my thanks and appreciation to all of those who serve on OEA Council. Uh, those who brought forward the OEA shift initiative and uh, who continue to uh, support uh, the development of architecture in, in our province. Um, I really appreciate the wisdom of the uh, shift initiative. Um, it focuses upon spending a bit of our valuable time um, thinking about ways in which those of us in this very privileged profession of architecture can in fact help to creatively and sustainably shape the future of our communities across Ontario. And in that regard, today we have two uh, very local and very timely uh, presentations to review. Uh, the first introduces us to Kirkland Lake, a Northern Ontario resource town facing the challenge of an end of life plan uh, for the mine and its community. Uh, told from the perspective of a young architect born and raised in Northern Ontario. Our second presentation will focus on how we can better support uh, the population of temporary workers who we ask to migrate here on an annual basis uh, to grow and harvest our food. So essential um, um, uh, to keep us alive uh, here in Ontario as part of our a fundamental part of our economy um, in, a, in a pretty difficult time. So in this time of COVID, COVID and its ongoing permutations and pandemonium, these are, I think, very useful conversations to have. And I wanna begin by just thanking our two presenters for the thoughtfulness and initiative evident in their, uh, in their presentations and their submissions to the OEA. Um, a, a technical note, the OEA is providing live closed captioning. We will also be taking questions from the audience after both individual sessions have concluded. Uh, please use the Q&A feature you'll see at the bottom of the screen um, rather than the chat box. Um, so let's start in Kirkland Lake. Holly Sutton calls herself a girl from a mining town and who wanted to, uh, a girl who wanted to figure out how she might fit into a future of architecture while remaining in Northern Ontario. She's now an intern architect working at uh, J.L. Richards and Associates in Timmins. Holly received her architectural education at Laurentian University's McEwen School of Architecture in Sudbury. Uh, she says the school's hands-on program offered her the opportunity to work with interesting remote communities, something she really looked forward to. At that point, she began thinking about how architecture and, can, and design could contribute to these regions. Her thesis entitled Mining Scars was essentially an end of life proposal for the local gold mine that dominates the Kirkland Lake landscape. 
Through her research, she brought people together, ideas and concepts from a variety of sources to create a framework for her hometown's future. Uh, Patrick Arup, an associate professor of architecture at McEwen, was her um, thesis advisor, a very valued uh, thesis advisor from what I can tell. He encouraged her to embrace the quirky and chaotic aspects of the project and guided her through the different research paths and trains of thought that have enriched the project. Let's hear Holly's story. A girl from Northern Ontario um, and growing up in Northern Ontario I didn't see a whole lot of architecture um, that really sparked my interest it was kind of more when I started going around and looking at different schools and really getting a chance to figure out what I wanted to do that I picked architecture I wasn't one of those kids that grew up knowing what they wanted to do um, but I saw how it could help communities and I, I, I really just wanted to bring that back to my own community. My name is Patrick Harrop. I'm a licensed architect, uh, but also I'm an associate professor of architecture at the McEwen School of Architecture. And I have served as uh, Holly's thesis advisor uh, throughout the duration of this project. My shift idea um, stems from being from a small northern town and wanting to really give back to the community um, because I looked at all the projects I had done in school, which were, they had really interesting programming, um, you know, like cafes, schools, student housing, things like that. And I wanted to do something like that for my community. But then I realized a lot of these projects wouldn't work in my community. And that really kind of started me on why don't these projects work? Um, so I kind of took a step back and looked at my hometown, Kirkland Lake, from an outsider's perspective. Um, and Kirkland Lake's a small mining community. It's a single industry community, meaning that um, most of the population relies on mining in some way. And how that really changes um, what type of programming you're going to introduce into it is that the programming you introduce needs to be able to shift, needs to be flexible. Um, mining towns like mine go through um, economic shifts, boom bust cycles, um, so your population can change drastically. Um, so I took a step back and I decided to really look at the community um, from an outsider's perspective. And what I realized was that the thing that made the community really unique, unique was the mine. So I decided to research that a little bit more. And a really unique thing about the project was that, um, and a unique thing about Kirkland Lake is that the mine actually travels underneath Kirkland Lake itself. Um, and how that impacts the community, how that impacts the environment is that you essentially have to dewater that area to be able for the mine to be productive. So Kirkland Lake does not actually have a lake because of this dewatering process. The lake itself um, was drained way back in the day. And so my project is looking at, okay, so what happens once the mine closes and this lake refills? So you're gonna have many things happening at once at that point in time. Like I mentioned, those boom bust cycles, um, you're gonna have the low economically, the, the population's going to shrink, but you're also gonna have the return of this lake, which I found super interesting. So that became the focus of the project. Um, and how I addressed this, um, the approach that I took was that I implemented um, kind of a phased design approach, um, which really looked at the life cycle of the community and what happened during this process. So all of the, um, all of the projects and all of the buildings that are part of this project um, 
all required um, very flexible design. They had to be very passive. Um, they had to require very little maintenance um, and they had to acknowledge that their use might change. So it might, a building might start out as a storage for equipment for the um, ecological rehabilitation of the lake, um, but then it might change later on and be um, a rental facility for snowshoes or um, kayaks um, as the lake refills. So that's, um, that's essentially what my shift project is. The common assumption is that these, these industrial towns are just going to, they're just going to die and they're just, uh, people are just going to move out. And what I was really fascinated with was uh, through Holly's proposal was how you can actually catalyze um, being a community member, but also catalyze through some building projects, small and subtle moves in building projects and also landscape approaches, how you could actually not necessarily grow a city uh, um, um, to what its former self was, but to, to at least make it uh, a livable and active community. And that's, that's what was really fascinated uh, about, about Holly's approach. And again, Holly was, well, my, my city is dying. I don't know what to do. And uh, one was to, of course, be realistic about it, but two was to try to see what was there and actually transform it somehow. It is generally just a very personal project. Um, like Pat said previously, um, it's me essentially trying to save my hometown from um, some perceived threat I have for the future. Um, so that's why it's important to me. And I, I think a lot, I, a lot of small towns, especially northern towns, um, I've worked with a lot of different towns right now as an intern architect, and they're facing very similar issues. Um, especially in Northern Ontario, there's, um, there's a big concern in, they want to grow, they want to help their community, but they don't really know how. And so I find a lot of these communities end up trying to do what, um, trying to use techniques from other communities that aren't necessarily going to work because of the context. So you have communities up here that are very similar to Kirkland Lake, um, trying to use strategies that are used in Southern Ontario in communities that are much more stable economically um, because they have more diversity. Um, and because we don't have that diversity up here uh, and in generally some smaller communities where you're relying on one single industry, you have to take a step back and really look at is what we're proposing right for the community. Just because it works for another community does not mean it will work for yours. And I think if that um, that position and that way of looking at things was used throughout a lot of these communities, they have projects that might be able to help them a bit more. And that's kind of why I like this project to influence influence really. These communities are born of these industries and and it's not just uh, um, in northern Ontario, it's actually all across North America. You know, it's it's in uh, cities like Sault Ste. Marie, but even even in urban cores like uh, like Montreal, which had an industrial sector which has shifted to another part of the world. So it's a very big problem because what we're continuously faced with is a deindustrialization at a massive scale that is happening all across North America. And yet no, uh, any kind of tangible solution that we try to find is usually trying to match the monolithic scale of these industries with some kind of monolithic activity, such as a giant art gallery or some kind of festival or, or something like that. And I think, I think Holly's approach is 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 really uh, um, is is much more modest, and it's being taken at the scale of of the actual community, where uh, where the interventions are are small, they're modest, and they're they're feasible, and that gives probably these communities a, a, a the best possible chance of taking advantage of the infrastructure that's actually there, and this deindustrialization. 
this deindustrialization wave that is going across uh, North America. I think it's actually a very, uh, it's a very important thing for us as, as architects to take the lead on because uh, um, so far the, the way that it's been, it's been handled is that these towns just die and they're left as ghost towns, which, which is all very interesting, but it, it does result in a huge, huge waste. So I think, uh, I, I think there's a much larger discussion about economics and sustainability and how we develop things that, that is really part of this whole, this whole story. Um, well, um, thank you, Holly, and thank you, Patrick, uh, for that wonderful presentation. Um, I have to say, as someone with uh, um, a bit of experience myself in the revitalization of brownfield sites, I was really struck by a number of themes in this proposal and in this presentation, Holly. Um, uh, a couple of them that Patrick just uh, focused on and you did as well, really, really hit home to me. Uh, one is the potential of renaturalizing our industrial sites and where that can take us. And your description of a lake that once was and then it wasn't, but it could become again, uh, you know, that, that's kind of a captivating image, I think, to hold on. Uh, Holly, I was struck by uh, a, a, an observation you made that I'm just going to quote. Um, the remediation of industrial sites is not exclusively a design issue. Rather, it is an issue which requires many different stakeholders and disciplines to be successfully accomplished. Um, I'm really struck by the fact you were born and raised in Northern Ontario. You were actually able to stay in Northern Ontario, go to architecture school. Now you're working in Northern Ontario and you got to dream about the future of your hometown that's in facing such a challenging time. I wonder if you could just maybe elaborate a bit, Polly, on, on that process of working with your neighbors, uh, people you knew, but, um, but from this perspective as an architectural student at the end of her architectural education, I, I, that must have been a fascinating uh, experience. Yeah. Oh, and I apologize in advance if I'm lagging at all. Um, I'm, I understand my connection's not the greatest. You're um, looking great, Holly. It's all good. Okay, good. Um, yeah, no, it, it was definitely um, a whirlwind of a, a project. And I, I kind of felt like a lot of what I grew up in led up to the project. So it was definitely interesting from that perspective. Um, and I think it's a really great question specifically um, because it, in my recent experience now working as an intern architect, it couldn't be any truer, this idea that it, a lot of the problems our communities are facing aren't exactly, aren't just design issues and you can't solve them alone. Um, a project like this is only as good as what inspires and brings life to it. Um, and those are the users of the project. Um, now, when it comes to the remediation of industrial sites, um, and from my experience researching different sites, um, a lot of the remediation plans come from the perspective of the industry that created them. Um, and they do an amazing job at covering the bases environmentally, and that's something I could never um, really touch on. So um, I, I worked for the project, I worked really closely um, with some of the environmental um, remediation experts at the mine and their wow. existing plan that they have um, because obviously um, architecturally I my experience and my um, my knowledge is limited in that area um, what I think those plans need though is someone with a bit of design expertise and then and that would be my I consider myself um, to kind of bring some of the those thoughts together and to bring in other opinions and other perspectives that might not necessarily have been incorporated in that original plan. Um, doing this by engaging community members and to try and get their perspectives. Um, and like you said, a lot of this came from informal conversations um, 
Mm -hmm. uh, it was actually kind of funny because a lot of the people like myself um, never gave two thoughts about the fact that the mine was under the town. It was just kind of um, common knowledge, I, I would say, in the community. But some of the other ideas, the idea that the lake would come back, um, when I would bring it up to people, they'd be like, hey, yeah, no, that'd be a kind of interesting idea. And then um, I, I'd get their input on it. And, you know, every different person had a different idea of um, what it could be. And I, I really tried to capture as much of that as I could because um, a lot of the answers made the project specific, uh, specific to Kirkland Lake. And there was no way I could have come up with it all on my, on my own. Those things really gave it life. Yeah, you, you know, Holly, just you know, what, one of the things you're just saying that I really admired about the project and the proposal, uh, Patrick uh, referred to its modesty and its practicality, and that is that you were, for your neighbors, effectively highlighting um, the nature of the place and its possibilities, uh, you know, try, basically bringing people's imaginations along, uh, it's, and that's a kind of a key role of an architect. So Shari, there's, there's uh, sorry, Holly, there's, there's uh, lots more to talk about, I think, in your project, but um, we're going to, let's uh, move, uh, move along now and shift um, to uh, the agricultural parts of our province, and we can come back and speak about Kirkland Lake a little more at the end. We're going to have some time for questions for both Holly and Gord. Um, but uh, the second presentation is uh, entitled uh, Temporary Foreign Workers. Um, and it's a presentation that's been developed by a team passionate about design research, creative problem solving with a social heart. Their combined expertise includes urban design, architecture, interior design, product design. Um, Lynn Stratford um, studied technical theater at Niagara College, interior design at Ryerson University, and currently focuses upon research. And I think it's her observations, I understand, about the Niagara region's uh, agricultural industry that sparked this particular submission. Uh, Gord Stratford is an Ontario architect, a fellow of the RAIC, an urban designer, product designer, studied at uh, Waterloo and McGill, and has been the steadfast and longstanding chair of the Toronto Society, uh, sorry, the City of Toronto Design Review Panel for, the, for over 15 years. Uh, Jordan Lambie, the third uh, person of this group, has studied urban and regional planning at Ryerson University and is a senior urban design planner at the city of Barrie. Uh, their collective project experience includes uh, many things that they elaborate on at the beginning of their uh, presentation, so I'm not going to dwell on that, except to say they clearly all love to design. They all like to clearly come together and talk about possibilities. Their influences include Lucienne and Robin uh, Day, Ray and Charles Eames, rural studio founder Samuel Mockby, and the learning that comes from volunteering uh, in your community, uh, just to name a precious few. Uh, let's watch this video, um, and then we'll come back and um, uh, talk to Gord about it. Thank you. I'm Gordon Stratford. I'm the leader of our team uh, that made the submission to Shift 2021. And our, our team is a really kind of an interesting combination of, of talents. We combine a background in theater, interior design, urban design, planning, architecture, and product design. And we never thought we'd get to use all of our expertise on one project, but in a funny sort of way, we did it this way. Uh, we consist of three team members, and I'll just let you know who they are. Uh, Lynn Stratford, who is, has the background in theater and interior design, and she is the person of our team who sort of observed the conditions for our case study that we included in our submission and said, we've got to do something about this particular situation, which I'll come back to. And then uh, Jordan Lambie, who is an urban designer and planner, and where he came in was certainly in those two areas, mainly in urban design. And what was particularly valuable about what he provided was some research into the, um, the urban design character or heritage or culture 
of some of the countries that temporary foreign workers come from. And then my background, I'm an architect and an urban designer and a product designer. And what really has grown in me is this notion that you can use architecture to really shift the world to a better place. Well, in terms of what's the problem for us, we found this absolutely fascinating because we moved down into the Niagara area a few years ago. And we realized when you enter, you come to an area, there's the community that you come into and you, you, know, you look at it, you become part of it. Um, but what we found was that there was more than one community. There was the community that you know, um, that you'd see on a daily basis. And then there was this, this unusual sort of invisible group or invisible community and, and they would come into the area every year, it, you know, it would follow the cycles of the planting seasons and the harvesting seasons. And it, it was sort of scattered and isolated. It wasn't a community that you would see um, openly. And we started paying a little bit more attention to this. And we found that this was this community of temporary foreign workers that would come thousands of miles, thousands of kilometers away from their homes. And they would work long, long hours. You know, they would, as soon as the sun rose, even before the sun rose, after the sun went down, they were always, always working and they were working hard. And we realized too, that there was, in addition to them, they represented each of them, a community back home. They might be the only breadwinner. They might be um, re relied upon by many more, you know, five people, six people, whatever that the, the generations might be at home um, who would rely on them traveling so far and spending so much time away from their family. And to us, uh, we looked at that and we went, you know, this is one of the definitions of resiliency, of, of being resilient. They, they're going above and beyond. And the other thing that was really interesting was that uh, the pandemic, when the pandemic hit, this little secret, this sort of secret hidden community came into the limelight because of their living conditions and how the um, the pandemic, how COVID-19 was able to so quickly and unfortunately so successfully um, wreak havoc, havoc in, their, in their, their, their population because of the living conditions. It's a community that really needs to have much better care given to them. And that really started us down the path. And what was our approach? Well, the, the thing that we sort of thought of is it, it feels like when you see this, this invisible community that it's more like a commodity. It's a group of people who come and they do manual labor and they produce like any vegetables that you get from uh, in Ontario with that you know, Ontario agricultural food mark on it. They place a big part in it. If they didn't come, there would be no food that comes from Ontario that, that ends up on our plates, your plate and mine. And so we thought, well, why don't we think of them as a community as opposed to a commodity? And that really started to unlock things because what we wanted to try to do was to take this scattered, isolated group of people and say, okay, it's more than just simply designing a better bed, you know, sleeping area. It's really looking at it in a holistic way from the macro, like creating a community down to the micro. And that is what is their individual room like? And, and how do you create uh, wealth in a sense of place as well. Um, so we were thinking about designs that would be for where you could gather people together and where that might be dispersed. And you see that in our submission, um, how it connects to the broader community because what Lynn was observing was that there was a, a really vibrant support network within the visible community that was there to provide aid to these temporary foreign workers. So for instance, uh, down the street from where we live, there would be once a year in the summertime, this dinner where uh, all of the for, um, temporary foreign workers would be invited and they would be served dinner. It was kind of like a neighborhood thanks uh, to, to the workers. And, th and that wasn't, wasn't all, you know, there were doctors and nurses <clears throat> and, and all sorts of support in the community. And then the whole notion that it would be uh, health and wellness focused, the pandemic pretty much laid that bare, that it's a problem that needed to be solved. So why, why do we focus on this? Well, uh, what, what sort of accelerated us was that the federal government towards the end of last year had a call for consultation. And we felt that this was a really um, opportune thing, but it was also kind of cautionary as well, because what they were looking to was um, a, a 
a, a, a crowd of people or participants that would be more governance oriented. So it was uh, representatives from the countries that the workers would come from, it would be the farmers, it would be everything except design. And we thought, okay, design should not be this afterthought. You know, it should really be there right at the very beginning at the, at the front of the, of the line uh, and, and at the table. So we took a chance, we said, okay, they're not asking for design, but we'll do a design and we're gonna submit it. And that's what we did. And, and to us, this is this change that I've certainly seen in the profession of going from being an architect to where you're just supposed to do designs and it's almost scholarly to being an activist. And I'm gonna come back to that because that's really important. And the reason, other reason um, I'll be quite honest with you was simply shame that these kind of living conditions could exist um, so quietly and so invisibly surrounding us and yet so essential. And I just thought, there, this, something's gotta happen here. We gotta do something. So that's what we did. We began to realize that this thing just multiplies out everywhere across Canada. I have no idea how many temporary foreign workers there are in Canada on a yearly basis, but uh, it, it could be applied anywhere. We just happen to use our case study in the Niagara region, but it, it can be down in Windsor. It can be in Ontario. It can be in any other province where agriculture plays a big role. And it's not just outdoors, it's indoors. A lot of the agriculture now happens um, under, under glass and under plastic in the, in the greenhouses. And that we knew that our design needed to be something that wasn't, it could be site specific, it could be specific to the area, but it also had to be universal. And that's why in our design, we looked at different ways in which these buildings and communities could be put together. So, and you'll see in our submission, we have what we refer to as a village, um, a hamlet, and, a, and I think it's a homestead. And the reason behind that was that uh, the farmers like to have their workers close at hand, um, that there's a very short distance between getting up in the morning and going out to the fields and working and then coming back to wherever you happen to stay at night. So we knew we, that we needed to create, um, we needed to scale to that, but we also wanted to scale to what should really happen. And that is to gather the temporary foreign workers together into a community because then services can be provided much more readily. And you really get that sense of having a home away from home. So we were thinking on a whole lot of different levels here from really, really high level down to the very detailed things. And how are the broader specific ideas replicable or applicable to other cities and areas and ways? I think it's totally, totally applicable in, in all means. This started as mainly an agricultural and a rural case study, but really the preparation of food, the growing and the harvesting, the delivering the whole food chain cycle happens both inside and outside. It happens in, in rural areas and at the edges of cities and towns. And really, basically all we have to do is follow wherever temporary foreign workers are in Canada. And that's, that's how it scales. That's how it's replicable. You follow that, you follow the people, and then you design from there. Thank you, Gord. Um, really appreciated that. I um, would just take a moment, leave a, let, allow a moment for the, uh, tech uh, things to come along and for Gord and Holly to appear. There you are, Gord. Um, Gord, I was, I was really taken um, by your description of this invisible community and, um, you know, a community that we see in the distance, but with whom we have little real contact, but, uh, but upon whom we critically depend <laughs> for uh, an important part of our food chain. Um, and and you're uh, kind of shining a light on the circumstances under which we ask people to come here, do this work, and live. Um, and and I think your reminder about that, particularly in a time of COVID, is um, is is really uh, really an important message. Um, it's it's and 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 I I think your your point about the tragedy. Uh, you know, kind of quietly here, in, in, just in the background, uh, that we we ought to be addressing in terms of these living conditions. Um, 
uh, I could not help but be struck uh, as someone who occasionally has worked at designing shelters for the homeless in urban situations that we're effectively housing migrant agricultural workers in very similar kinds of conditions. No privacy, very little dignity in terms of that. So uh, putting that together and appreciating what you and your colleagues went through, Gord, I guess I'm uh, wondering, uh, given your time to reflect on this now, what would you see as the kind of uh, next two or three key steps from an architect's perspective that might help to uh, kind of move this issue along. Your point about architects potentially needing to become more activist in their nature, uh, the challenges of affordability. Uh, where do we go from here, Gord? Wow, there's there's so much to do. Um, I, I think that uh, you brought up a really good word a couple of seconds ago, Joe, and that was that whole notion of dignity. And, mm -hmm. and I think uh, one of the next steps that, that we as our team would like to take is to actually activate further, to advocate further, because there is so much more to do. And if I were to look at it in a series of steps, there'd be sort of like an umbrella of trying to create a, a sort of a sense of dignity and community. And it really comes down to sort of um, health, home, and health. And the, the first one we think about is health. It's, it's, it's a universal need. And this is what brought this submission in the first place was the COVID, uh, the COVID conditions. And being able to, um, to, to get that to, to, be, to be solved. And with each of these ones that I just mentioned, there's a design element that goes with them. Again, follow the people, follow the chain, and that's where design can come in. And then the, the sense of home, uh, I think as you were mentioning, it's almost like um, homeless shelters, it, very, very similar. And the idea of being able to almost you know, start to do like an alpha test or a beta test in terms of taking either a, 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 a small example, find, find that early adopter who would be able to say, hey, I've got you know, 100 farm workers who come up each season and I think I'd like to try this. And there's community support that goes with that. And then the other thing is, is help. And I mean, help beyond the, the health and wellness. It's the groundswell of community organizations that are there already. In our case study area, our team was amazed when we saw the number of people who on a, a daily basis, almost like an, another invisible, but very active community of people who are repairing bicycles and making them available. They were you know, like a transportation department for, for this, uh, this invisible community and, and food and, and, and everything. And really combine all those three together because with that you are starting to create a community. It can be small, it can be large, and really see that as each each step we take in a particular area. Think about where else could it be applied? How could it be scaled up, down? How can it morph? How can that resiliency, which is really all action oriented now, like we're doing this with with urgency. This is not an academic conversation. This is urgent. How we keep thinking about that at the same time. So sorry. A lot of, yeah. lot of words answering a very simple question. Thank you, Gord. Um, so I just wanted to remind everyone on, on this uh, call or um, uh, event today um, to use the chat or the Q&A function, I think, if I recall correctly, I've probably got that backwards, but use the Q&A function if you have any questions you'd like to forward uh, to Gord and, 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 and Holly. Um, as was described by Susan to begin with, uh, the OEA shift theme uh, this year was resiliency. Um, and um, both of your projects, uh, Gord, you spoke about uh, the incredibly uh, um, required resiliency of a migrant worker, just what they have to uh, uh, deal with and adjust to the circumstances. Um, and Holly, I was struck in your project by uh, a kind of theme about, okay, uh, the mining might be over. Uh, there's this residue that's there. Um, we need to be thoughtful about it. We need to be light on our feet. Maybe we can use some of this stuff in an, in an interesting way. We can renaturalize a lake and turn that into something. We can use these structures and, and maybe they can have another function, but maybe that function needs to change. You know, these are all words that both of you have you described and used that really uh, speak to this topic of 
of of this challenging time. And then, you know, with COVID, I think, uh, Gord, I remember you saying something like, uh, you know, how uh, has how, how the current pandemic fundamentally forced change upon everything we have thus far considered to be immutable? You know, like where that that I here's my question as architects, what creative opportunities do you see emerging from these challenging times? Uh, is, is this as crazy as it is? Uh, I'm struck by the creativity both of you are bringing forward um, and, and the opportunity uh, inherent uh, in, in the situation. Holly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I think um, a, a big thing for me, especially because I was working on this thesis project right at the beginning, well, I presented right at the beginning of COVID and it couldn't have been more relevant because um, the, the concept I was going for for my project was the ability for a community to shift and to adapt. And the idea that I think like many of us through COVID, um, that to come out the other side, not necessarily unscathed, but um, to be able to meet challenge, to adapt, and not only to adapt, but um, to come out the other side maybe in a different form, maybe um, maybe if in the um, specific to my project, maybe the community is a different size or a different industry, but to come mm -hmm. out and, and to meet that challenge head on. Um, and so it, it was actually very good timing for me, um, um, theme wise, I guess. <laughs> right, I, I guess it really reinforced the, the the critical nature of community revitalization in a place like uh, Kirkland Lake, it's it's not only a, a global pandemic, but it's the end of a of a way of life and and a and a and a time to renew. It it, it you know it it's um, a, a potent set of, uh, uh, of 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 issues coming together. I think um, specifically because even even with COVID, we've seen some shifts, um, not necessarily in the, the mining industry, but um, in a lot of different industries, how we're working. So to have that ability to have that flexibility has never been more important. Mm -hmm. I, I, I could add to that. I, I think in the past 20 years, I've noticed a growing appreciation of design and creativity. And as COVID hit, I saw that that curve just just shoot up um, into the stratosphere. Um, for, for, you know, it's a it's a very tragic thing, uh, the pandemic, but also it has unleashed a level of creativity that is I, I have never seen before. Just in the the town that I live in, of uh, about fifteen thousand people, all of a sudden people are are doing startups in their garages, and mm -hmm. this quiet community is just bursting with ideas and. From a, for, for an architect to have a look at these things happening, it's like it's a perfect time for us, really. It's it, it, it's it's a it's a challenging time, but there is no end of things that need to be solved and that we could play a part in. Um, so, um, uh, Holly and, and Gord, um, we do have a couple of questions from uh, the folks that are uh, watching today. So, um, if I might. Uh, put them out in front of both of you. Uh, one specifically for you, Gord, from Jason Watalis, asking whether you've encountered any political or public backlash to proposals that would acknowledge the presence of migrant workers, uh, particularly in regions where local attitude towards transient workers is to keep them invisible. Have, have, you, have you encountered in, in your work, Gord, did you get any sense of that, that, you know, no, just leave it alone. It was the sort of, uh, or, or, or did you get a sense of uh, support for, uh, you know, wanting to do better? I'm, what was your experience? It's, it's a good question. And it's been, it's been mixed. I think that before COVID, uh, there might have been sort of an approach that this, this may not be pretty, but it works. You know, we have where we couldn't get anybody else to do work on the, in the orchards and in the vineyards. Um, there's this skill set, and and it works. The, the 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 guests, these essential guests arrive each year, and they go through the cycle. Uh, I think that the pandemic is certainly it, it forced open a door that maybe people just wanted to have kept shut, um, but it really laid bare the the fragility of how that setup actually works, especially from a health perspective. 
And uh, moving forward, um, our team knows that we have to be careful moving forward. There are certainly lots of groups of people who are very supportive and they see a need for change and something to be done differently. But there are others who go, hey, wait a minute, I can't afford anything else. This is what I have to do um, in order to run my business. And so it's a mix. It's a really a mix. But the pandemic, I think, is opening people's eyes to the fact that things that used to happen and could continue can no longer happen. So I think we have momentum on our side. Um, and um, we have um, a couple of other questions uh, that I'm going to kind of combine because they, I think, are, are a bit different but related. Uh, one from St uh, Stacy Voss, I hope I have that pronunciation correct, and another from Deborah, Deborah Wadsworth. Um, and, and, and one of them is, uh, Stacy's question is a bit more general with respect to the reaction in both of the local communities where you focused your efforts. Has there been any local reaction? Has there been any kind of uh, uptick or a sign of, 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 of the idea you have brought forward stimulating um, an action or a, or a thought on, on the part of someone else, I guess? And then, and then I think specifically, Gord, with respect to the foreign workers topic, um, perhaps you could just come to the uh, topic of while the conditions are harsh, I think, I think the point that um, uh, Deborah makes is while conditions are harsh, um, the, the conditions are integrated, say, in a place like the Holland Marsh within the community. Um, if, if, the, if, if we start to make uh, particular communities for migrant commu for migrant workers. Uh, how do we avoid um, further isolation and a ghettoization, if you will, where where they're over there? Uh, so there's a, the larger uh, the larger point of the reaction in the communities and where this might go, and then th that specific topic. Uh, Holly, uh, do you want to take a first track at that, and then Gord? Uh, sure. Um, so to answer the kind of question of um, if I've brought this more to a political level, um, it's a bit not a not a touchy subject, but um, the community itself and the mine itself, um, there is no foreseeable closure currently. Um, so what what that really means is the mine is doing really well. Um, so there's not uh, it's I'm not per se that there's not interest in it right now, um, but. You know, while while the mine is in boom, no one wants to talk about bust. Um, so um, I haven't brought it to a political level. I've I've discussed it with a lot of different people, um, but it is something I'd like to move forward with um, eventually and and bring to that next level. But um, just the fact that it, the timing may be not right now. <laughs> Uh, to to um, add to the answer, I think uh, the question that came up about is there a danger of sort of ghettoizing? We, we thought about that, and that's the reason why in our submission we tried to come up with um, an approach that could scale up or scale down according to the needs. Uh, our main our main goal was to try to make sure that, that there was a community that was built and created, whether it was small or whether it was large. And uh, as an example, the, um, the village concept that we, that we had, this was the intent that where we would finally be able to do all the things about bringing the services, all the support services to the, um, the essential guests. And that that would become, uh, that would improve the, the quality of life, but also make it uh, work better in terms of being able to then um, help the workforce that would work in the different, the different farms. When it came to something like a homestead, we scaled that down so that instead of the services being there all the time, they'd be in pop-up space. We would uh, still have some of the basic um, DNA of trying to create something that was passively designed um, that would shelter against the wind. You'd have garden space um, so that the, the workers could bring that culture of garden, house gardens or kitchen gardens uh, up into the place where they were working for the summer. And so we were trying to be really sensitive to um, a one size doesn't fit all in that. And uh, we're, we're hoping that that will start to be able to, to, to create that kind of flexibility, depending on the location, depending on the, uh, the mode of operation that the agricultural industry has. 
Um, and uh, appreciating that we're um, close to uh, concluding our time, uh, there were a couple of additional questions, and I'm again going to try to combine them around the theme of affordability and funding. And uh, Holly, uh, you and uh, Patrick um, raised the topic of being modest, but you know, but thoughtful in terms of reusing of the infrastructure and resources in the places we have. And, and Gord, you know, a good chunk of what you're going to talk about is, or your ambition is in a challenge sector already, agriculture, and the topic of affordability. Any very quick, uh, very fast, if you can, each of you, uh, maybe Gord, you first, and then Holly, uh, you know, maybe 30 seconds on the topic of affordability in this crazy time. Okay, uh, I'll dive in first. Um, in part of our submission, we looked at um, uh, modulars in terms of the rooms. Uh, what we were trying to do is we were trying to find a means of, uh, of, of creating uh, uh, an efficiency of being able to build things, but also make it so that you had a plan that could be developed locally as opposed to having you know, a central place in Ontario and everything gets shipped to uh, British Columbia. We, we looked at... Um, means by which uh, from an affordability point of view uh, we try to uh, tap into the ability for the essential guests to actually be part of the construction crew itself so that it would make it feel as if it, it belonged to them the ownership the sense of ownership was really important uh, and we also just used very simple materials very simple um, we're, we're really looking at state of the market things that are already proven and can be done and, uh, and a means of construction that would be transferable. It doesn't take highly specialized, more expensive means of doing things. Mm -hmm. Those are all good points, Gord. Those are thoughtful. Um, Holly, appreciating uh, the kind of sensitive nature of what you describe in Kirkland Lake and, and you know, timing and the challenges of investment in Northern communities. Um, any further reflections on just that topic of affordability? How do you get your foot in the door? How do you start things off? How do you attract money? How do you attract investment? That was a worry of mine when I was designing the project. So I, what I focused on was A, making all of my structures flexible in that, um, as Gord mentioned there, well, not specifically um, to structures, but um, making sure they're of simple construction. Um, I focused on adaptive reuse wherever it was applicable, um, just because um, to factor in the cost of building materials. And then also I looked at passive design just because um, communities like mine, they might get an upfront amount of funding to build something, but the maintenance to run things is where, really the killer. And, we see a lot of our empty building stock is just because A, we don't have the population anymore to support it. Mm. B, we don't have the funds to keep those buildings open. Um, so that was really how I, I took a step back and made sure I was um, keeping budget in mind <laughs> for the project. Mm -hmm. um, no, I appreciate that, 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 that very much, uh, Holly. I, I was... Um... I, I can't help but be struck by the uh, power of, um, you know, formerly active industrial landscapes and how they might change and be become useful again in some other kind of way and, and, and the landscapes they're part of, uh, you know, it, it, uh, it, it sounds really engaging. And, and Gord, um, uh, might I say, I really appreciate you and, and, and your colleagues, the, the kind of light you've shined on something that in a in a place as incredibly successful and wonderful and economically vibrant as as Ontario, uh, well, you know why can't we provide more leadership? And so, really, thank you, Gord, for the leadership that you and your colleagues have uh, demonstrated um, um, with the proposal here. And exactly what the uh, oh, I think the OEA had in mind when they began this program. So. Um, I think um, I'm going to, I think we've kind of re uh, run out of time for today. Um, um, I, I've really enjoyed, uh, I appreciate the invitation from the OEA to help moderate this session. And I really appreciate um, uh, Gord, you and your team's uh, uh, submission, Holly, uh, the effort you made. Uh, I really love the story and I'm anxious to now visit Kirkland Lake and learn more. 
Uh, thanks to both of you very much and for all of you uh, watching from your homes and offices for participating today. The OEA has recorded this session and it will be available in December along with the first shift webinar on the OEA's YouTube channel for viewing. I also understand that there's an OEA shift publication in the works. You can probably go to the OEA website and find out about that and also uh, learn more from OEA social media. Uh, there will also soon be announcements about the OEA conference taking place in Toronto in May, and there will be both in-person, let's hope, and virtual options for many of its talks and events. Thanks everybody for joining us today. Best wishes.